here, and today we're taking a look at Pathfinder the Adventure Card Game, published by Paizo and designed by Mike Selinger. Now, just a little bit of backstory in case you've never heard of Pathfinder before. Uh, so, there's Dungeons and Dragons, and Dungeons and Dragons, if, even if you've never played it before, you certainly know the name. It was not the first tabletop role playing game, but the first one to really get recognition many, many years ago, probably 30 years ago at this point. And it went through many different iterations. It was originally published by this company called TSR before TSR kind of went under. And Wizards of the Coast, who you might know as a company that brought you Magic the Gathering to this day, bought the license of Dungeons and Dragons and put out a third edition in the early 2000s that was really popular for, I don't know, seven to eight years, something like that. And then the Wizards of the Coast partnered with this company, Paizo, which had done some gaming stuff before, but mostly just like subsidiary stuff to Dungeons and Dragons. And they partnered with Wizards of the Coast to put out these two magazines, Dungeon and Dragon. And eventually Wizards decided that they wanted to put out a fourth edition of D&D &D and leave third edition behind. And they also broke off their partnership with Paizo for publishing the magazines. But Dungeons and Dragons third edition was an open source license. That means that anyone could take the basic framework of the Dungeons and Dragons 3.0 system, they called it the D20 system, and make a game out of it. They couldn't use some specific copyrighted stuff from the Dungeons and Dragons universe, but you could take the basic framework of the game. So Paizo wanted to continue with third edition and they thought it could they could improve it somehow. So they created the Pathfinder game. And Pathfinder, a lot of people call it Dungeons & Dragons 3.75 because Wizards had eventually made Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 and Pathfinder just has the, basically the same system but just some tweaks to make it better and they made their own game universe to set the system in and so on and so forth. So what does that have to do with this? Well, Paizo decided they wanted to break into the board gaming business a bit more and they've done some other stuff uh, in the past few years. but. This is their attempt to take the Pathfinder universe into the board and card game realm. And Pathfinder Adventure Card System basically has the feel of an RPG in a card game form. You are going to, each person that comes to the table is going to create a character. And when I say create a character, they'll take a character and actually make a deck of cards that represents that character's capabilities and life points. And then you're gonna take these characters on adventures to locations that you build as decks of cards and fight villains and his, their henchmen that are seated throughout the decks of cards and you gain weapons, you gain armor. So it has that feel of an RPG but designed to be faster. You can do it in one sitting or you can do multiple campaign adventure paths. So this doesn't always work but there are some examples of this working quite well. I mean Descent, even though it's a very different game than this, has the feel of an RPG that you can sit down and do in one sitting or you can do an extended campaign. So does Pathfinder, the adventure card game, manage to pull this off with enough grace to make distinguish itself from other types of dungeon and fantasy type games that try to encapsulate that RPG feel? Well, I played the game a couple times and we're gonna take a little overview of it and then we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think about it. So I'm just gonna give you a very brief overview of the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. It can be a little daunting with the setup at first, but the actual turn to turn gameplay is very simple. So in every game, you're gonna to have to construct the locations. And the locations are actually where you're gonna to go to find the villain and his henchmen or meet your specific goal. And they're also gonna contain items and loot and allies and all that kind of good stuff. What locations you choose are dependent on both your adventure path. And this is the basic adventure path. This is the Perils of the Lost Coast which will tell you all the different scenarios and the rewards you get for completing the entire scenario. On the back is a little bit of backstory. And then here is the first scenario. You've got Brigand Doom and you've got, it'll tell you right underneath in small print which villain to use. So you've got uh, Jubrail and you also have to include his henchmen, which are just a bunch of bandits. And then you've got the special power for this scenario, which says that when you recharge cards, you actually draw cards as well. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute and the different rewards you get for completing a scenario, which is that uh, you get to take a random item from the box. And so you'll pick your scenario. The scenario will tell you what locations to choose dependent on the number of players. We're gonna have four players, so we need six different locations. And we've got the wooden bridge, the woods, the academy, the farmhouse, the waterfront, and the prison. Let's go ahead and take a look at the academy. One side of the locations is just gonna have some backstory telling you the history of the location. The other side will tell you, uh, first, 
in this little inset box is going to tell you what items and allies and all kinds of other stuff that you're going to need to construct the location deck. So you see for the academy you need a one monster, one barrier, no weapons, five spells because it's an academy, it's going to have a lot of spells for you to choose from, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of other different stuff here, like at this location, you'll have a special ability. If you don't find a spell right away, you get to go through an encounter again. Um, you have the opportunity at a certain point to close a location, which will be to actually uh, get rid of all the other cards in the deck and find out where the henchman or villain is if you haven't defeated them yet. And if it is permanently closed, uh, certain special things will happen, like on closing, you can shuffle a spell from your discard pile into your deck. So. I'll explain more about that in a minute, but that's the basics of a location card. And character decks also have to be built as well. And character decks won't include anything like monsters, but they will include items and spells and allies. So you'll pick your characters, and this is just a generic group of fighter, rogue, cleric, and wizard that I chose. And these cards here are actually just character tokens. All they have is a picture of the character, their career and race, and then some backstory on the other side. But you use these during the game, as sort of placeholders to determine where your characters go. So if my character card is here, that means that uh, Kyra is going to the farmhouse. So we have the cleric Kyra, and we have the sorceress Sioni, and the fighter Valeros, and the the gnome rogue, uh, or the gnome bard Lem. And if you have the character add-on pack, you have a lot more character options. There's more from the base set as well that I haven't shown you. A lot of different options, and you can play from if you have the character out on pack, you actually play up to six players, which means you'll put out more locations. But that's just the character token. The character card itself is going to show you the different stats of the character. So on one side, you have the basic deck construction. You're going to have a row of numbers over here that's just going to show you how many, the disposition of the number of items you can have. So uh, no weapons, three spell cards, no armor, three items, three al or four allies, five blessings. And then everyone's got a favorite type of card, like uh, Sione's is a spell. So if in her opening hand, if she doesn't have a spell, she can redraw and reshuffle. These little white boxes represent feats. When you uh, win different scenarios, you might gain the possibility of gaining feats, in which case you'll actually fill in one of these boxes and gain a bonus. In this case, you'll increase the number of particular items you can have in your deck. Now, I sleeve my cards because I don't want to write on the cards permanently. I'm going to use like a wet erase marker. So I would recommend that if you plan on playing this with different groups of people and resetting the characters. On the other side, you have your actual stat block. So you have the six different abilities. And if you've played Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, you're familiar with them, Strength, Con, Dex, etc. And there's different dice associated with each ability. Now, the base game comes with a set of these just generic blue dice um, from D4, D6, D8, uh, D10, and D12. I highly recommend getting as many as you can and building as many sets as you can like I did because these dice are going to get passed around a lot, especially when you have four or more players. So make sure everyone has dice or easy access to dice at the table. And your dice determine what you're good at, essentially. So Sioni's a sorcerer, so her strength it sucks. So she's only got a d4 for that. But her charisma, which is what she uses to cast her spells, as odd as that might sound, is really, really awesome. So she has a d12, which is the highest die. And you see there's these little boxes here too. Well, if you use your feet powers to gain boxes there, you'll gain permanent bonuses to those stats. So if I, and you always fill up the lowest first, so if I gain a feat and put it plus one in my charisma, I'll always gain a bonus of plus one when I do charisma based checks. And I, in particular, also have bonuses in Charisma for Diplomacy and Arcane, which I'll always add when applicable. Underneath, you'll have your hand size, and it's different for different people, and certain character classes can also increase it with, like, a feat. And then other powers, like, for instance, Sioni can take any card from her hand and effectively use it to make a spell, even if she doesn't actually have an attack spell in her hand. Um, and there's all kinds of other stuff that characters have as well. Now, in later games, you're actually going to have access to different role cards which are like specialties. So this is the roll card for the monk, and he can become either a Zen archer or a drunken master, but that's in a much further scenario path, like especially when your characters level up a lot. So what are all of these particular cards that are going to go into the location decks and into the character decks? Well, just real quick, you've got weapons, and you've got weapons like the mace, and you've got the, hand, the light crossbow, and you've got the shock longbow, and you've got the great sword, and <clears throat> you'll see that there's a... These are all the different types here. It's like this uh, great sword, sword, melee, slash, and two-handed. 
that becomes important for certain things like uh, skeletons do very or maybe not skeletons but other types of monsters are, have a lot of resistance to slashing weapons and some monsters have resistance to bludgeoning weapons and things like that and that's when that becomes important um, down here you have the special powers like for a great sword you can reveal this card which is to actually show it from your hands to uh, roll a check and you can or you can this card this card to add more strength to it etc just really briefly up here you're going to have a number that all the cards uh, in the game that you find in the location decks have which is a number you have to either acquire it or defeat it if it's a monster this is the number to defeat it if it's a uh, a good thing like a piece of loot this is the number to acquire it and you're going to have to make some sort of check and that's the number you have to meet or beat so in this case you have to make a melee strength check so you'll you'll roll the die for your strength uh check, add any strength bonuses, add any melee bonuses you might have for it being a special character, and if you can meet or beat that number, you're good to go. You're going to actually take this card into your hand. And the reason why it's important to take cards into your hand or to hopefully add cards to your deck during the course of the game is that your deck is your life points, not for the location deck, but uh, your deck is your life points. If you ever run out of cards, like all the cards are in your discard pile and you don't have another card to draw, you die. So there are certain things that are going to let you recharge cards by instead of discarding them, you're going to put them on the bottom of your deck. And that's good because even if it's a card you would like to draw again, at least it's in your deck and you're not going to die anytime soon. But those are weapons. And then you've also got armor, which could be anything from a wooden shield to half plate to elven chain shirt to magic leather armor. And you see they have numbers here too to acquire them. And... You've got the items, which could be a lot of stuff. You've got magic items like braces of protection. You've got thieves tools. You've got a crowbar, which is very simple. You've got holy water, which can defeat undead monsters. Uh, you've got spells. So you've got holy lights. You've got cure, which can actually effectively, you can, you can take cards, uh, make a player, including yourself, take cards from your discard pile and put them into your deck which doesn't seem very thematic, but remember that your deck is your life points. And you've got Force Missile, and back in my day we called that Magic Missile. And you have Detect Magic, which is much more useful in this game than in the tabletop RPG. And you even have allies, which sort of function like items. You have to acquire them in the same way, but they'll have different effects. So like the Troubadour, uh, if you recharge this card, which is you put him back underneath your deck, you'll actually add a D6 to a Dexterity or a Charisma check out of combat. Or you could get a more powerful effect, which is discard this card to explore your location again, because you only get one explore per turn. And you've got a standard bearer and a guide and a night watch. And wait, there's more cards. Then there's barriers. And barriers are like a catch-all category for anything that might impede your progress that you run into. But sometimes they're helpful. So there's a locked passage. There's an ambush. There's a skeleton horror. Well, that's definitely not helpful. But then you might find treasure chests. Excuse me like the battered chest, which you might actually be able to pop open and get some random items. So that could be good for you. And you've got these amulets, the blessings of the gods, which uh, basically there's a generic one called the blessing of the gods, and there's ones keyed into the different gods of the Pathfinder realm, universe. And they'll all do different things. Um, so like you encounter this card, you automatically acquire it. This card, this card to add one die to a check. This card, this card to explore your location, and so on and so forth. Now that's just for the generic blessing of the gods. Now, these different blessings here, they're gonna all have this different thing in the bottom. It says if the top part of the blessings discard pile matches this card, you recharge this card instead of discarding it, and they all have different effects. Well, what does that mean? Well, you have this deck of cards out here. This is the blessing deck. And then, sure enough, it's full of all the different blessings in the game. And this, at the beginning of a scenario, it's going to tell you to, or maybe it's just the base thing in the rules, it's going to tell you to have a different amount of cards in here. Uh, for the, just the base game, it's going to be 30 cards. And why this is important is that this is effectively a timer. At the beginning of your every turn, that's the very first thing you're going to do, is you're going to flip a card from the top of this deck into the discard pile. If this deck ever runs out, the players all lose, because the villain has managed to escape. But there's also special effects for having cards in the discard pile. Whatever card is in the discard pile, the characters will have these blessings of the gods in their deck, and these can effectively mimic the ability of whatever the card is on the top of the discard pile. So it says here, you may instead treat this card as if it were identical to the top card of the blessing of the discard pile. So that means I can have this count as the blessing of Shalin if that's the top one out and have it use all of its abilities. So that's blessings of the gods. And of course, there's one more card that we need to talk about, and that is monsters. 
which you won't find in your deck, but you will find in the location deck. So you have an enchanter and you have, hey, a bugbear. Hmm, that sounds familiar. I think I know a bugbear actually. And you have a werewolf and you have a goblin warrior and they have numbers just like the items, but that you have to uh, meet or beat to defeat. And of course you'll use spells and you'll throw weapons down in order to meet that number. And they have things to say if they're undefeated, you have to bury an item, which is to put an item underneath your card, effectively removing it from the game, and so on. And if you defeat a monster, it's banished back to the box. But if you don't, it gets shuffled back into the deck. So they're bad news. And if you don't manage to defeat a monster, whatever the difference is, like let's say that you tried to fight this goblin and you only accrued uh, seven points, and he's got nine, he actually deals two damage to you. And damage in this game is discarding cards from your hand, and at the end of the turn, you have to redraw back up to whatever your hand limit is, which effectively kills you a little bit. Because if you run out of cards, you lose. So the whole goal is that you're trying to find Jubrail and his bandits, who are all seated throughout these decks. And if you manage to uh, find Jubrail and defeat him before the, the Blessing deck runs out, you win. Uh, even, but you must make sure that all the other locations are closed. By closing a location, you're effectively taking the finding the henchman or villain that's there and uh, getting rid of all the other cards in the deck by doing a special check. Like for the woods, you have to succeed at a wisdom of survival check. And uh, the reason you have to do that is because if you even if you defeat the villain at a certain location, if there are other open locations, he's just going to run away to one of those open locations. But if there are no other open locations, or if, even if you just temporarily close locations, which is something you can do, then he has nowhere else to run to. You defeat him, and you can take him out for good. So there's a lot of other little things to this game that I just didn't have the time to go into, but that's basically the Pathfinder Adventure card game. I love this game, and I can't remember, honestly, the last time that I played a new board game or card game and was smiling as much as I was the first time that I played this game. Now, let's just get the bad stuff out of the way, because there is a couple faults with this game, and I <laughs> I say faults, because, but no game is perfect, so I'm really reaching here to tell you something bad about it, because I'm trying to give this a balance, and po a balance review. So the setup is bad, okay? It's, I mean, it has to be by necessity, but it's just a, a really clunky setup that is one of those things, I've said this before about other games, you're like a City of Iron and stuff like that, you have to set this game up ahead of time. If you know that people are coming over, you have to set up whatever the adventure is. Which, again, this is, that feels just like a tabletop RPG. Hopefully, if you've played a tabletop RPG, your dungeon master or game master sets up the game ahead of time. Otherwise, it's just a, people, a bunch of people sitting around, you know, BSing about Doctor Who or whatever. I don't even like Doctor Who. But, <laughs> uh, so, that's one thing. The setup, trying to get those location decks and all that. Now, the character decks, if, that, uh, if you're doing the continuing campaign, you really only have to do that. Uh, once and then your players will do the upkeep at the end of a game session and you know your characters will just evolve that way but if you're just doing it if you're just pulling this game out every now and then you're not doing the adventure path you're also going to, have to do the character decks which can also add to the time so that all is very fiddly and that takes a lot of time so that's a knock against it the other knock against it is that there's a lot of down there can be a lot of downtime between characters turns now in a couple games that we played, it, it wasn't too bad because, you know, it's a cooperative game. So you're still interacting with each other. You're trying to help each other. And you do have certain player powers that, like the dwarf, I think his name is Brask. Uh, one of his special powers is that he can uh, essentially fire an arrow at another player's, uh, to help another player who's at another location. So there is that little bit of interactivity. But then again, there were other times where I was literally just kind of sitting there for 10 minutes watching the other people play, helping with advice when I could, but not really doing anything. So that can be considered a knock. Okay, that's the bad stuff. Let's talk about everything I love about this game. Because, like I said, I was looking for a board game that was had that RPG feel, and you know, and this was a card game, and it's just awesome how it all clicks together. Building your character, first of all. Let's start with the basics. Building your character and having this deck of all your different capabilities, which you can either use, I, I seriously recommend for your first time, you use the pre-gen uh, character item lists from the back of the rule book because it's just easy and you know it doesn't feel like you're uh sandbagging yourself i mean you're you know it's still very fun to play with just with those pre-gen sets uh but in future games having the capability of looking through the items and even if it's basic gear just customizing your character and you can trade items with other characters before you even start the game feels very cool and very thematic and 
you there's a, I I would also recommend that. So I don't know if I think that if you really think you're going to like this game, just go ahead and buy that character add-on pack because having those extra characters to choose from. I know that one of the people I played with chose the monk and has never looked back. Loves that monk, and that monk is in the character add-on pack. So that's something you might want to consider. Um, and really, it's just I don't. <laughs> to be honest, they probably should have included it with the base game. I don't know why they. Oh, well, I know why they didn't for money, but. It's, if you know, if you have a really good expectation you're going to like this game, just go ahead and buy it. You'll save yourself some trouble. Uh, and so you have a lot of different options of characters and a lot of different options of weapons and gear and all that. And then, even with the base game, I'm always afraid with a game like this where you're doing different scenarios that you're not going to have enough options. But there are a ton of locations. And the game comes with the built-in pack of the start of the Rise of the Rune Lords. But... Really, you could have a lot of fun just going through the base scenario. They call it the um, the Lost uh, Coast, I think it's called. The Lost Coast Adventure Path. It's just kind of like the introductory scenario. But it's three different scenarios that are a lot of fun. And honestly, any one of them could be a self-contained game of itself. Of course, you would get tired just playing that. But you could do it a few times before you get bored. And, you know, I already anticipate that I'm going to be playing this with a new group of people soon. And I'll probably just start with the first one again. Why not? It was fun. You know, that's... but. When you want that variety, there's a ton here. Lots of locations, lots of different monsters, without even having to get any of the umpteen expansions that they have planned. So kudos to them on that. Uh, the way that the combat works, uh, I really like that too. Um, sometimes it felt like the characters were actually a little bit overpowered, and then of course you run into that one situation where you're, it's totally the opposite, and you're getting totally pwned, or you just have really bad dice rolls, which is the mitigating factor. But uh, I really like how... Uh, you are you have your basic you're adding weapons you're adding items you're adding boosts and your other players can help you then you're making the roll and uh, i love that you're it's so it seems so simple but the deck as life points i never really would have considered that i mean it seems so obvious now but it's a really interesting way and you know your the cure spells and the heal spells can recharge cards which is effectively giving you more life points by letting you put cards from your discard pile back on your deck and you can make that choice of, I can play this card for a powerful ability, but I have to put it in my discard pile, which in essence kills me a little bit, but I could get a weaker effect and just recharge this card back to the bottom of my deck so I live longer and I can get to draw it again. But who knows? I mean, it's, you know, the, I love that little bit of choice there. Uh, I also love the idea of having the option of making your character progress down different routes by having different feats and eventually getting different roles that you can choose from. So it's all really great. It really feels like a simplified version of the tabletop RPG, and that's not a bad thing. I can imagine that some people that actually like the RPG a lot, the Pathfinder Adventure game, are won't like this as much because, well, why well, wouldn't well, well, they just play the original RPG? But for those of us that have kind of just either not ever gotten into tabletop games but like the theme, or those of us who were in the tabletop games but we've moved on, that's a different part of our nerdy lives, uh, this game is really really good um i'm very eager to see what they come out with in future expansion packs i mean this game will be a money sink unfortunately but hopefully a very fun one that has a lot of replay value especially with different groups and just experiencing adventure in different ways so that's the pathfinder adventure card game from paizo i highly recommend it my highest recommendation at this point uh, my name is nick this has been board game brawl reminding you to get out there and game every day and in every way take care